Hey guys, Tyler here from Foam Frat, and I wanted to make a quick video talking about how I use ultrasound to help me make some decisions, uh, specifically decisions regarding rate control and fluid assessment. And so I want to start off with a case, and this is something that I noticed I kept running into. And it would be a patient that was hypotensive and tachycardic. And in this example, I have AFib RVR. And I was wondering what came first. Is this tachycardia compensatory? Because we know if you have AFib and you're hypotensive, your flavor of sinus tach is going to be AFib RVR. And RVR is just defined as a heart rate over 100. And so I have this example here. We'll say that this guy's septic. You're going in for an interfacility transport. Your blood pressure is 88 over 42. And you notice you have AFib RVR. And we'll say the rates are going somewhere between 120 and 150. Well, what do you do? If I slowed down that rate, is it going to increase my diastolic filling and get me more stroke volume by optimizing preload? Or is it going to drop cardiac output because this was a compensatory mechanism? How do you know? How do you make that decision? And so I know I'm not alone in this having to decide whether I want to do something about the rate or just leave the rate where it's at and assume that it's compensation so I don't uh, do an inappropriate knockout of a compensatory tachycardia. And so you can see here I got the actual rate problem, um, and this isn't it. I'm actually just knocking out the compensation. So I had on Josh Farkas, Dr. Farkas from Palm Crit. <clears throat> this was probably a couple of years ago, and uh, he did this flipping the podcast approach to the shocky patient in AFib with RVR. And he came on the Foam for App podcast, actually, and we talked about this. And one of my favorite things he said in this blog is this. I'm just going to highlight this. He said, when you slow down the heart, you're directly dropping the rate in the hopes that the stroke volume will indirectly improve due to increased diastolic filling. Uh, but then he goes on to say, however, suppose you drop the heart rate from 120 to 60, it's unlikely that the stroke volume will double. So you're inevitably going to drop the cardiac output. And that, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. That really clicked with me. And it reminded me of these big buckets that you see at water parks. And when I take my kids to the Wisconsin Dells, um, I see these, uh, these big water buckets. They fill up and then they tip over, right? And if I were just to imagine that, you know, it probably tips over because it's full of water. It's probably not timed. But just imagine it is timed, right? And somebody increases uh, the tipping frequency. So now instead of, you know, tipping over every three minutes or so, it's tipping over you know, 10 times a minute. Well, that means that you're not going to have as much volume when that bucket tips over. It's going to be very anticlimactic for uh, the kids. And so you can say that when you increase the heart rate, you do decrease the preload, right? And that works for this example. But where this example kind of falls flat is that if you slow down the heart rate, you don't really know if you're going to get an increase in cardiac output. Um, so like in this example, if I slowed this down, well, yeah, then I would get more water in the bucket with each uh, with each dump. But I can't necessarily say that for cardiac output. And, and this reminds me of Starling's curve, right? And so if you look at the x-axis, which is like the bottom down here, I always think of x-axis like x marks the spot. This is your preload. And so I can see that where this x-axis has, it starts to go across to the right as I increase my preload, I get an increase in stroke volume. And that, that's awesome, right? That's where we're hoping patients are when we give them fluid. However, not everybody's Starling's curve looks the same way. If you take a patient that has heart failure, uh, their Starling curve may look like this. They're not going to get as much squeeze for an amount of preload. So I went to MD Calc and I just played around with some calculations. And I said, all right, let's pretend that I got a heart rate of 120 and a stroke volume of 50. Now, I'm trying to increase my stroke volume, and so let's just say that I decrease my heart rate to 80. So that's not that much. I mean, that's like, you know, you, you take somebody in AFib RVR with a rate of 120, 130, and you get them down to 80. That's not unrealistic. That could easily happen with like a DILT push or something, a diltiazem push. 
Now, if my stroke volume doesn't change at all, look what I just did to my cardiac output. My cardiac output dropped from six to four liters. That's pretty drastic there. And the patient's blood pressure is obviously going to drop and plummet. You're going to crap. I wish I could take that back. Now, let's say best case scenario, you do get some increased diastolic filling. So let's say that the heart rate now is 80 beats per minute and you pick up 25 mLs in stroke volume. Well, that's great, but that's still six liters in cardiac output. It didn't really change anything. And you could argue, well, it probably decreased the myocardial oxygen man because the heart doesn't have to beat as much as fast. And that's true. Um, but at what cost? What if you, how do you know if you're going to go from A to B? Is there a way to know? Or if you're going to have A or B, I should say. I think there is. And I think that's ultrasound. And so I'm going to show you this image right here. And it may not mean anything to you right now if you're not familiar with ultrasound. Uh, but there's a couple things that I want you to pay attention to. And I'm going to tell you right now that this is a patient in which I would not want to drop rate. The rate is not going to do anything for me. What it's going to do is it's going to hurt me. It's going to drop cardiac output significantly. How do I know that? Let me show you. So this is a, a parasternal long view of the heart. And the way you do a parasternal long view or what it is, is a, a long axis of the a view of the heart, a long axis cut right down the side. So here's my probe and I'm going to shoot my little beam out. And this is what I'm looking at. So you can see I got a uh, left atrium. I got mitral valve. And then I got the left ventricle. And then you got this little path. We call this the left ventricular outflow track. And this is where blood goes out the aorta. And it goes out the ventricle, out the aorta. So the way you get this view, you put your probe on the sternoclavicular notch just to the left of it, right? So like right here, and you point your probe marker towards the patient's right shoulder. And so you're going to slowly slide that down. And, and when you see the heart beating, you know you're close. And then you just start rotating it until you hit it right across that long axis. And this is what it should look like. So again, left atrium, this is our mitral valve, left ventricle, and then left ventricular outflow track in aorta. And we get a little glimpse of that right ventricular outflow track over here. So think about the, the cardiac cycle. The left ventricle contracts. It ejects blood out into the aorta. And then at the end of systole, we reach a point or a period where the pressure in the left atrium is now higher than the pressure in the left ventricle. And so that pressure gradient allows that mitral valve to open up and fill the left ventricle with volume and fill it up with, with blood. And the way we see that, the way that's visualized is by that mitral valve opening up, slam, I don't say slamming, but opening up, you know, pretty uh Pretty apparently, you see it opening up like those old Western barroom saloon doors. So if you see the mitral valve and it barely moves at the end of systole when it's opening up, uh, that's telling you that there's not that much of a pressure gradient, which means that the left ventricle probably didn't eject as much blood as it normally does during systole. And so we can actually look at that mitral valve as well as look at the actual uh ventricle in them, the muscle around it to see how well it's contracting. So let's look back at this image here. So you see how the mitral valve right here is really far away from that interventricular septum. See the septum is right here. Here's our left atrium, mitral valve, and then left ventricle. You see how far away that septum is from the upper inflection of that mitral valve? That is telling me that there's not that much of a pressure gradient between these two. Now, do we still have a pulse? Yeah, we can see we have forward flow because we can see the aortic valves opening up. But look at the ventricle. Look at the actual ventricle around here. You see how it's really not contracting at all? It's stiff. It's not moving. If I were to slow down the heart rate, do you think that increasing the volume inside that ventricle is going to do anything for me? No, it's not. I can, I can easily tell that this myocardium is not appropriate. It's not working appropriately. There's wall motion abnormalities, as you would hear. And you could flip this to something called a parasternal short, which I didn't include this. Maybe that'll be a separate video. And you would see that uh, the ventricle is just, it's not contracting. It's just moving like this. It's akinetic is another word of, 
another way of saying that. Maybe parts of it are moving, but I'm not going to get any more increase in stroke volume by slowing down this rate. This rate is trying to maintain cardiac output by rate because the stroke volume is so poor. Let's look at another example. So let's say we throw this, uh, this ultrasound probe on the heart and the, uh, it looks like this. So this is another parasternal long view and you can see that the left ventricle is just engorged. You see how much blood is in there? And that's pushing on the walls of the ventricle. That's increasing the resistance to coronary perfusion. So I like to give this example and I'll say, all right, you got a patient who comes in with chest pain and their blood pressure 70 over 40. Um, are you guys okay with me hooking up an IV and giving you know 250 mLs of, of crystalloids? And everybody usually says yes. They're like, yeah, you know, 250 mLs. Like nobody's ever died from a cup of coffee, right? That's how much volume is approximately in a cup of coffee. Yeah, that's fine. And I'm like, all right, well, let's just look at the heart real quick and, and see what's going on. And I throw this on and I show it to them and they look at this and they're like, oh, wow, no, I don't want to give that fluid anymore. Immediately, even if it, there's no like significant experience in ultrasound, uh, they still look at this and say, I can tell by what you just told me about what the parasternal long view shows that this is not a patient that is in that you know fluid responsive area. They're not on that ascending portion of Starling's curve and they don't need fluid, right? What do they need? Well, they need you know, a PCI. They got to get this fixed and uh, possibly a balloon pump to go in and something to decompress that left ventricle because it is big and it's engorged. Now, does this patient have a pulse? Yeah, well, they have forward flow <clears throat> because you can see the aortic valve is opening. A pulse? Well, I don't know. <laughs> that depends on if you can feel it or not, right? They may have a pocus pulse, but it may be very weak. This patient may even be mistaken if you didn't have ultrasound as being in a PEA because the rhythm will look organized, but you may not feel a pulse. But this patient isn't in cardiac arrest. The heart is working it's in an organized rhythm but the heart I, I guess saying the heart is working is probably a little misleading it is working uh, but the ventricles are not working appropriately all right so that 250 mls you know maybe you don't have ultrasound you're trying to decide you know should i give it should i not well if you give it and you don't see any improvement well then you probably know that that didn't help however some people may just think oh i just didn't give enough and so I really like utilizing ultrasound for fluid assessment, but maybe not how you think. And that's going to bring us to our next topic is fluid assessment. So, you know, we go back to the rate control. You look at it. If the heart looks like it's adequately beating and you notice that the patient has good ventricle function, but their heart rate's tachycardic, um, you probably should do a, a fluid assessment and think maybe before I go in and try to like slow down the heart, I wonder if optimizing or maybe giving a little bit more preload is going to help them in terms of stroke volume. So how do you do that? Well, I look at all three of these. I look at the heart, the lung, and the IVC when it comes to my decision to give somebody fluid. And I'm going to say that the, uh, the things that maybe you were taught about the IVC um, may not be correct. And you got to be really careful about how you interpret the IVC. And the reason is because we have to think about the problem and then what that problem is causing. So the IVC should typically be collapsing with your respiratory cycle. So you take a breath in, you'll see it come up, come back down, you'll see the IVC come back down, and there's about 50% collapsibility. And if something changes with that, or you look and the IVC is just thick or what they would call plethoric, that means that there's some sort of venous congestion that's going on. There's something wrong upstream that that blood is not being pumped efficiently. And so I think of, you know, here's the problem, the result, and that's the traffic jam or the IVC. So to frame this, let's think about this. Let's think about the normal gradient as we go from arteries to veins. So arteries, capillary, you know, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, and then back into the IVC. Um, you should have a loss of pressure as you go from the aorta 
to the IVC. And that's normal. We want that kind of like vascular waterfall. You want to see that pressure decreasing because that's what's driving the blood back to the heart. So on the arterial side, you got the blood pumping. It's pulsatile, you know, pulsile, pulsatile. But on the venous side, as you go through the capillaries, you lose that pulsatility. And so it's basically just kind of flowing back to the heart. But in order for it to flow to the heart, the right atrial pressure has to be the lowest pressure in the venous system. If you have a right atrial pressure that's super high, you imagine I take this IVC or this CVP pressure and I elevate it, well, then that's going to make the ball get stuck in this little area right here. It's not going to be able to flow into the heart. And so the way I explain this is I say, imagine you start an IV in like your hand or something, and then you hook up a transducer to that IV. So that way you can see what the actual pressure is. So, you know, kind of like they do with an art line, but now we're just putting it in a vein and then you're transducing the pressure on that vein. What do you think that pressure would be? And everybody guesses, and it's somewhere around like eight to 12 or so, uh, you know, seven, somewhere in that range. So let's just say this. Let's just say I put an IV in your foot, uh, you're laying flat on your back, and the venous pressure inside your foot when I transduce it is about seven. All right, and then let's say that I have a, uh, a CVP catheter in and I'm able to transduce a right atrial pressure. Well, if my right atrial pressure is zero or one, you know, somewhere in that range of a normal CVP, zero to five, then I have a nice gradient here. That blood is going to flow right back to the right atrium. And that's good. That's what we want. We want that nice that waterfall, you know, where the pressure's lower over here and it's higher inside the actual venous system, that mean systemic filling pressure. So let's just say at this gradient, I have this amount of flow. So, you know, whatever number this would be, let's just say here is my flow to the heart over here and at a venous mean systemic filling pressure of like seven, eight, whatever, and a right atrial pressure is zero, this is what my flow looks like. Well, what if I increase my CVP a little? Let's just say I lose a little bit of efficiency or something happens or somebody's on a ventilator, something increases the right atrial pressure. And I'm only gonna increase it by a little bit. You can see that if the mean systemic filling pressure stays the same and I increase the right atrial pressure, then what's gonna happen is I'm going to reduce my flow. Now, albeit not a ton, but I did reduce that flow a little bit there. Well, what if I really increase the right atrial pressure. You know, let's just say I increase it to five and this mean systemic filling pressure isn't changing. Well, you can see I reduced that, that flow back to the heart significantly. And so as these two pressures get closer and closer, um, then what's gonna happen is eventually if the pressures are the same, then you don't have flow. That's where that, that Pixar ball was kind of just floating in the little half pipe of the uh, vascular waterfall there. And this is how I think of it. You ever seen these things at, uh, I don't know, they do it like fire department, like cookouts and stuff where there's a barrel and they both have to squirt the barrel and they have to see who can get it to move to the other side. Well, there's a, uh, you know, if they're both doing a good job, there's no gradient. It just sticks right there in the middle. So here's the venous filling pressure trying to get the blood back to the heart. And then here's the increased right atrial pressure that's not allowing that barrel to fly back or to slide back. So in order to have flow, you got to have two things. That's what the, all this is to say is you have to have two things. You got to have cardiac output. So we got to be able to get rid of the blood that's coming in, pump it out. And then you also have to have that blood returning. And so if I have both of these things, then I have flow. And so if you think about the, uh, the IVC is like this little area right here, you're going to see that, that varying. You're going to have that flow. However, if I turn off this spigot here, and let's just say that's like a really poor cardiac function, you know, an ejection fraction, like 10% or just a reduction in that, what's going to happen? Well, this is going to start to fill up and it's going to make the IVC get thicker and thicker and thicker until eventually it loses that collapsibility. So here's how you do it. This is the phased array probe. This is the probe I like to use. You can also use a curved linear probe, um, but 
I, I, we have at my shop two probes. We have the linear probe, which is like for vascular access. And then we have the phased array. Uh, the curved linear is what they call like the abdominal probe. We don't even carry that one. We basically do all of our assessments with the phased array probe. And so what you do is you take the probe and you're gonna put it right below the sub xiphoid process and you're gonna aim the probe marker up towards the patient's head. And so I'm gonna do this here. So I get my uh, sub xiphoid view so you can see my sub xiphoid view of the heart. This is important, I like to get this first. And then once I get that, I'm going to rotate the probe and you wanna trace the IVC back to the right atrium to make sure you're actually looking at the IVC and not looking at something like you know the aorta. And so when you measure this, the way you measure it is you have the right atrium right here, and you're gonna measure caudal to the hepatic vein. So uh, we're measuring, you know, here's the hepatic vein right here, and we're gonna measure about one to three centimeters from the right atrium, or just, just to the, uh, I don't know, down towards the foot of the patient of the hepatic vein. So you want to measure in this range right here. And the reason is, is just because you can get some influence from the right atrium up in, in this area. So this is where you want to measure, about one to three centimeters from the right atrium caudal to the hepatic vein. Now, if you are doing this in an abdominal mode, everything's going to be flipped. Your right atrium is going to be over on this side. I have better luck utilizing cardiac mode when I'm looking at the IBC. And it's probably because I'm doing that sub xiphoid look and then I'm rotating it and looking at the IVC from there. So my right atrium is always on the right side of the screen. However, if you're doing this in abdominal mode, it'll be flipped, it'll look the other way. Now you can actually measure the collapsibility and I don't know how beneficial that is, but what you could do is you could drop an M line, which is like a motion line down the middle of the IVC and then you can trace it. And so you're gonna see you know, it's widest diameter and you're gonna see it's narrowest diameter. And this can give you a, a maybe a, you know, a, a subjective way, or I should say an objective way of looking at the collapsibility when I think subjective is probably the what most people are doing. They're looking at it, they're seeing it collapsing, they're going, okay, you know, the right atrial pressure is probably not super high in this patient. And uh, they probably, it wouldn't hurt them to get a little bit of fluid. And I think that's the way to look at it. You know, you see a heart that's really hyperdynamic and it's beating well. It just looks like it could use some volume. And then you look at the IVC and you see it's got, you know, good collapsibility. Then I would say that that's a patient that volume isn't going to hurt if you gave them some. Um, however, if the blood pressure looks well, it looks good, and the heart rate's like, you know, 80, 100 or something like that, and then you look at the IVC and you notice that it's collapsing, that doesn't mean you have to give them volume. Like, the collapsing, and I can't stress this enough, is just the sign of a very efficient system, a low right atrial pressure. And an elevated CVP or an elevated right atrial pressure is like a pathological state. We want that to be the lowest pressure to drive that venous return back to the heart. Now, if you look at a textbook, it'll say that the IVC diameter should be somewhere between 1.2 to 1.7 at its thickest and have 50% collapsibility. All right, now we talked about the heart and the IVC a little bit, um, but the other thing that's important to look at, and I say anytime you're looking at the heart, you should always look at the lungs as well. So I'm gonna show you what a B line is. You probably heard like B as in boy line before. What that is, is the secondary lobules getting thick. Let me show you what I mean. So these little circles here are gonna be like your primary alveoli, your primary lobules. And they're clustered into these things called secondary lobules. And so this little pink, excuse me, this little pink area here, we'll say that uh, this is like, you know, your airways going into the alveoli. And then you see the little, uh, the, the blood coming in from the pulmonary artery. That's the blue stuff, the unoxygenated stuff coming from the right ventricle. And it goes through and it circulates all the little alveoli around the airways, the capillaries, and then it drains back into the pulmonary vein. So we'll say like, you see like these pulmonary veins in between these secondary lobules, and these both are gonna go back to the left atrium now with oxygenated blood. Well, imagine you have a left ventricle that is not firing appropriately. Cardiac output is decreased. Well, what's gonna happen is you're gonna 
get an increase in hydrostatic pressure of that left ventricle. That's going to increase the pressure of the left atrium. And then that's going to go all the way back and start to congest the uh, pulmonary vein. And that is going to make these thick. So I'm going to make these thick real quick. So you see these are getting real like thick and plethoric now. And what that looks like on ultrasound is lines that are appearing. And so this doesn't necessarily mean that there is fluid inside the alveoli. This is fluid in that interstitial space where those secondary lobules uh, the, or the vasculature lines those secondary lobules. And so in order for it to be considered a B line, you want to see like at least two to three per intercostal space. So you see this like shadow over here, and then we got a shadow over here. These are both ribs, and we're looking between those ribs. And you can see this uh, vertical line coming down. We only got one here. However, if I were to uh, say that, you know, let's say that this patient didn't have this before, I gave him, you know, a liter of fluid and all of a sudden this starts appearing, that's going to get my spidey senses tingling a little. So again, we're just looking between these two ribs. You want to see it usually two to three between these and you want to see it extend down past around the 10 centimeter mark. So let's just say that, you know, this is before fluids and I can see these nice A lines. A lines are these horizontal lines. And then after fluid, and maybe I'm looking in the exact same spot, you know, so that way I know that, you know, this is, um, this is tr a trend. This isn't just a, a different part of the lung that I'm looking at. And after it looks like this, I'm going to be a little bit more concerned. I'm gonna be like, hell, oh, you know what? It, maybe that is fluid in the interstitial space, even though it doesn't meet the actual B line criteria. Now, what about this one? Now, this one for sure. You can see that uh, we have a bunch of B lines. And this is actually getting on the border of like a consolidation or what they call hepatization of the lung. And that's where the lung starts to look like the liver. <laughs> if you think about the liver, you know, it's full of fluid. And that's exactly what the, uh, the lung is in this situation. It's completely full of fluid. And so you're starting to see more of that congestion and you see that hepatization look and that like it just looks like the liver. It's the same sort of uh, echo texture of the uh, of the liver. All right, let's do a case. So we'll say we got a guy whose blood pressure is 110 over 60. His heart rate is 140. Um, I don't know. He's septic or something. Right. And so we take a look at his IVC and it looks like this. All right, so we can see the uh, hepatic vein, and we're going to measure right, probably right around here. And uh, what do we see here? Well, you can see all of this, the hepatic vasculature is getting real, uh, real thick here. It's getting engorged. I don't see much collapsibility at all. I can see the right atrium looks really dilated out. So what does this tell me? What does this tell me? Is it A, that they are fluid responsive, B, that they are fluid overloaded, C, they have an elevated right atrial pressure, or D, that they're in cardiogenic shock? Well, this is a, a little bit of a trick question, right? Because you're probably going through this going, all right, are they fluid responsive? I don't think so. That IVC looks like a steel pipe. There's no way. Well, are they, are they fluid overloaded? If they could be, right? This could easily be a patient who's fluid overloaded, um, but I don't know, right? I don't know what's causing the traffic jam. I'm just stuck in it right now. I can't tell. I haven't looked at the heart yet. I haven't looked at the lungs. I don't know. Do they have a pneumo? Do they have tamponade? I can't tell. I just know there's congestion upstream. Well, does it tell me that they are in uh, cardiogenic shock? I don't know. I didn't look at the heart yet. All I can tell is that there's congestion. So all you can say is, C, you have an elevated right atrial pressure, and you got to keep going investigating and looking for the reason why. So let's say you look at the heart and now you see this. Okay, now it makes a lot more sense, right? I can tell that this heart has wall motion abnormalities. It's akinetic. Uh, I don't know why it's akinetic at this point, you know, if it's from ACS or, you know, what the patient has. Uh, maybe a little bit of fluid here, but not much. This patient does not have pericardial tamponade. And so uh, this patient has an elevated right atrial pressure due to a decrease in cardiac output. And I know that's slowing down the heart rate. Ding, ding, ding is not going to be the trick here. And actually giving fluid isn't going to be the, the solution either. So I got to figure out how to give some uh, something to increase the inotropy. Patient needs to go to PCI if this is an MI or they need to be put on a balloon pump or have a Impella put in. So that's how you start working through these differentials 
um, with ultrasound. And this has helped like drastically. And, and, you know, like, okay, now let's look at the lung real quick. All right. Yeah. Now he's got fluid backing up in the lung. That's just great. Right. So that goes along with this entire clinical picture. So I looked at the IVC. It's plethoric. I looked at the heart. Okay. That's why it's plethoric. I look at the lungs. I can see I got lungs sliding, which means he doesn't probably have a pneumo, um, but he does have fluid in his lungs. He's getting congested now. A congestive heart failure. All right, let's take the same patient, same vitals, and uh, let's say that we look and we see the IVC and it looks like this. All right, so I see the IVC. Um, I don't need to sit here and measure it, right? I can tell it's small. I can see it's collapsing. Now, the thing with the IVC is it can collapse this way or this way. And so sometimes it's smart when you're looking at it in a long axis like this to flip it over and look at it in its short axis. So you're actually looking at it like this. And you can take your, your probe that's typically like facing up towards the patient and then just flip it on its side. So you can look at it on its, uh, on its short axis to see if it's collapsing. Because if you're looking at it this way, you'll catch it collapsing like this, but you won't catch it collapsing like this as much. So I look at the IVC and I go, okay, this looks like um, they're not in any sort of venous congestion. I would estimate that the right atrial pressure is actually pretty low. And then I look at the heart and I see this. All right. Well, I can see this uh, mitral valve is getting real close to the septum up here. And I can see that the ventricles look like they're like hitting each other. It's very hyperdynamic. So this is a patient that would benefit from a fluid bolus. They are on the ascending portion of Starling's curve. And if I give them a little bit of fluid, I'm going to see an increase in stroke volume and further cardiac output. And, uh, you know, you probably don't even have to, but I still would look at the lungs just to see what the, uh, the lungs are looking like and to see if I can, uh, I don't know, just just to, for solidarity purposes, still take a look at the lungs and make sure that uh, you don't see any fluid just to complete the entire assessment. So I hope that was helpful. That's how I've used ultrasound to guide a few things in pharmacology. Um, but I would say, man, if you're, if you're trying to figure out if something is compensatory or if it is a rate problem, you got to look at the heart, right? We got to look at the heart, the IVC, the lungs, and if it leads you to deciding that the IVC is indicating a low right atrial pressure, you got good collapsibility, and the heart looks like it's dynamic, then that is compensatory, um, and they may benefit from some fluid. Well, then you also say, well, okay, well, what if the heart or the IVC is thick and the heart is not contracting appropriately? I see a decrease in cardiac output. Um, due to the fact that the, there's just a low stroke volume. Well, that's still compensatory, um, but that patient's not, and you don't want to reduce the rate, but that patient's not going to respond to fluid. So you start putting all this stuff together, and I really feel like this helps make just, it really like adds some confidence into my decision making uh, when I'm trying to decide, you know, the chicken or the egg, are they going to respond to fluid? Should I even think about decreasing the heart rate? It's been a great tool. So I hope that was helpful. If you guys have any questions, uh, hit me up, Tyler at foamfrat.com. Thank you.